Good afternoon to you. I am Mark Suddeth here in Wilmington, North Carolina. It is Monday, the 27th day of February 2023, and we have a lot to talk about today. We usually do, and today is no different. It is quite the wild week ahead. Ridiculous amounts of snow. I mean, we've seen a lot. What is coming for parts of the West, especially in the Sierras of California, and even spilling into Nevada? I mean, it's just going to be ridiculous, but it's a good thing. I talk about that often. You need the snowpack, you're going to get it, and it's just going to keep piling up. But, but then that storm is going to come across the country. We're going to have another bout of severe weather as the seasons sort of start to battle each other here. We're still in winter. We're getting ready to start meteorological spring on March the 1st. That's just a couple of days away. We've already seen record temperatures in the east recently, in the southeast, of course. And, yeah, things are starting to be changeable as the seasons progress and we gradually shift the pendulum towards spring. And then we have the developing potential of an El Nino in the tropical Pacific, and that is going to throw almost a literal monkey wrench into everything, giving us a, a bunch of chaos. If it wasn't chaotic enough, get ready for more. All right, and of course, we'll take a look at some things related to that. Um, actually, we'll start off with that. So let's just get on with it, shall we? Thanks for joining me. I do appreciate it. And we'll start with the SOI, Southern Oscillation Index. Some of these numbers recently did dip below zero, got into negative territory. Remember, this is just an index, like the U.S. Stock Exchange is. It doesn't, it's not a temperature, it's just an index. I don't know how else to explain that, but um, it's just a way to keep track of it. It is the product of the difference between the pressure in Tahiti and in Darwin. And lately, it's gone negative. And we are uh, positive again. A lot of positives with just a few negatives. And you can see on the charting here, we've turned it around on the 30 days, starting to go positive again. It's going to be an interesting few weeks because we're getting into what's called the spring predictability barrier, where the changes of seasons and everything else going on related to that kind of confuse the models where normally they try to look at some constants where you're going to get a lot more variables coming up because we are heading into the spring season. And naturally, we get a shift of winds here, higher pressures there, lower pressures over here, whatever. You just get a lot more variables, like I was saying, instead of the constants that most of science likes to see to give you consistent results all the time that are more predictable. And that's why they call it the spring predictability barrier, because there is this hump we have to get over as the seasons change that throws more chaos into the overall mix. Somebody's texting me. We'll just put that over here for now. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that and see what's happening. The SOI, a great literal barometer to look at how things are going. And until and unless it goes strongly negative, we're not really switching the atmosphere around to where it can support a warm event in the tropical Pacific, or what we call an El Nino. All right, and we can look at all of this on the uh, global Mercator projection map of our flat Earth, at least it is here, for the sea surface temperature anomalies. We have warmed it in the eastern part of the tropical Pacific, but just in the last few days, we've started to cool it off again there. Those are some pretty cold anomalies, probably short-lived. This area is very sensitive to change. It's very easy to have strong spikes, plus or minus, very quickly. And then the ENSO 3 region and 3.4 region out here, this is the main area that we really watch related to hurricane season. That's still running generally below average, but gradually the tropical Pacific all through here is starting to undergo some changes. There's a lot of warm water at the subsurface, way out in the western Pacific. We'll take a look at that in, in due time. But gradually, yes, things are changing. But just notice a few other things, like the North Pacific up here, I mean, everything north of the equator is the North Pacific, but the subtropical North Pacific, and then the true North Pacific up here, right, is definitely still running cold. So we're not having this overwhelming warm Pacific with just a little island of cold anomalies left. There's a lot to chisel away here to really flip the pattern. And at the same time, as we are almost to March, and then closing in on 90 days to hurricane season, most of the Atlantic Basin is at or slightly warmer. The case of the areas here near the United States, the Bahamas and vicinity, very much above normal. And that all has to be taken into consideration because what we're going to hear, I promise you, 
as soon as NOAA or the Climate Prediction Center says we're in an El Nino watch, yes, that's really a thing, and El Nino looks like it's coming for sure. Well, nothing's for sure until it happens, but you know what, how that works. We're going to hear a lot about how the deep tropics out here are going to be virtually shut down. Well, when have they not been in these last several years? I mean, except for 2017, that's my Discord talking to me. I had a um, colleague of mine up here over the weekend, and we were tweaking and messing with some... You know what? Let's just mute the speakers. That should do it. All right. Um, we were messing with stuff, and I got text messages and Discord talking to me. That's all right. We'll keep rolling. We're going to hear a lot about the dead MDR for the 2023 hurricane season. Well, I don't recall much coming out of there last year, and we still had Ian, right? We still had Fiona, except for 2017. This is where I was going with this. The MDR, since the last Big El Nino of 2015, has kind of been dead anyway. It's been uh, dealing with a lot of instability issues out that way. I'm more concerned about these areas here. In fact, let me just drop back for a second, go back to the main page, and do this. I'm more concerned about this right here. You know, that's one, two, three days tops from where most of us live. We got a lot of people that live down here that watch what I do. Yes, I think this is the areas where Enso, El Nino, whatever, will affect the most. Going back to the global once more real quick, most of the Enso positive or El Nino effects from here, that really impacts this part of the Atlantic Basin, maybe a little bit farther east. But the eastern Atlantic and the subtropical Atlantic up here and the Gulf of Mexico El Nino and even La Nina typically does not impact those areas. And the reason has to do with the upward motion that we get down here in the eastern tropical Pacific, even the central tropical Pacific. You get air that's rising here. It uh, creates strong westerlies that cut across. And that usually sort of abates once you get to about the central tropical Atlantic. So to simplify it, El Nino doesn't mean no Atlantic hurricane season. And you're going to hear a lot of oh, this is good news, and it should reduce the numbers. Yes, those are all true facts, but you can still have one sneak in. Look at last year as a great example. It was definitely hyped as well as it should have been because the data suggested last year's season was going to be potentially historic. It fell far short of that. That was a good thing. Yet, even though it still fell very short, we still had Fiona and we still had Ian uh, I think it's, you know, no one would argue that those were generational major impact storms. So we just have to keep it in perspective is all. And we'll watch this. The Atlantic still, yeah, running warmer than average generally as we wait and see what happens with the evolution of the ENSO, El Nino Southern Oscillation. One of the tools that we use to watch, one of many, I like this one, is the CFS V2. comes out every day, so it really caters to my obsessive nature, I guess. I mean, it's not obsessive if it's work-related, right? I don't think so. But yeah, I look at this every day and I see what's going on. And here's your blues. These are your ensemble members that are the latest runs. And there are more and more of them here. It's kind of a mixed bag, but there's more of them lately falling on the lower side of the ensemble mean, so meaning cooler temperatures overall. And then even this one right here that's still holding on to cool neutral. And, you know, there's still plenty that are warmer, yes. But this, again, that's that spring predictability barrier. Um, think about when you see these movies, and even in real life, right, when spacecraft go around the moon and sometimes other planets, and they talk about we're going to have a communication blackout. I think it even happens on reentry with spacecraft into the Earth's atmosphere for various reasons. There's a communications blackout. We're not going to hear from the spacecraft or the astronauts for a particular period of time. That's kind of like what we go through here. There's a window in the spring, as I said earlier, that we just don't have the best data. Too much going on, too much chaos, like I said, too many variables. And a lot of that has to be taken into consideration when we see these wild swings. Some blues down here, those are your latest members, like I said, and then even some up here. It's like a cone of uncertainty or ensemble plots. When it's real wide, there's a lot of variability. When everything is narrow, um, you have a lot more confidence in the forecast, and this is definitely not a high confidence forecast for ENSO right now. 
All right, let's move along, shall we? As I said, the battle between spring and winter is still ongoing. It's been going on for eons, right? And in the western United States, this is quite remarkable, blizzard warnings. I mean, it snows a lot in the Sierra, but to get blizzard conditions? Remember, a blizzard has nothing to do necessarily with the amount of snow. It's more about the visibility, the reduction in visibility, the wind speeds, and that kind of thing. So having blizzard warnings for the Sierra, it just makes it more dangerous. So a lot of snow coming, they're going to measure that in feet in some of those areas. And as I've said numerous times over the last few months, this is a very positive thing to see for the ongoing water crisis. And it definitely is. That is not hyperbolic at all to say that. It's not for hype or headlines or BS. It is true. Too many people live out west, not enough water. This will help with that even if it's just temporary. So it's impactful, yes. It closes roads. It creates problems. Uh, but in the large uh, the scheme of things, it's a good thing to see for the long run. Um, some fire dangers over here. Of course, we have the tornadoes in parts of the mid-Oklahoma, um, uh, central Oklahoma region around Norman and elsewhere. The yellow is a tornado watch now for parts of Ohio and uh, Indiana. And um, just, wow, like the, the seasons couldn't be, look, blizzard here, tornado here, winter storm in the Hudson Valley and parts of New England. Yes, we're getting into that transition period uh, where winter and spring will really start to collide. And we're going to have more severe weather down south here, and then probably eventually in the next few weeks, it's going to really start to fire up more in the nation's midsection. I saw a tweet earlier today that January set a record for Oklahoma. I believe there were five tornadoes. That's the most that have ever occurred in the month of January. And February has done the same thing with seven so far. They have to confirm or... Um, I guess show that some didn't occur or whatever the weather service does that but we are up to seven so far for February and that's also a record and I remember too I think I showed you this a while back a couple weeks ago or something Eric Webb was showing some of the CFS uh, precip values for this area for the spring indicating the possibility of above normal precip which could indicate a very busy spring severe weather season I think we're starting to see that and a big part of that ladies and gentlemen I go back to the golf shot over here. Uh, the golf is very warm, and that helps to feed all that moisture. And the way the troughs are digging in and the snowpack out west, everything's starting to come together. I think we're seeing that right now, January and February, have been so active that should continue on into the true heart of the season of severe weather. And that is, of course, April into May and into June, even beyond you know, the, the early part of the spring. So here it is on the satellite animation. Just a beautiful shot here. If you're into weather like I am, this is pretty amazing. Here's your one storm coming into the west. Lots of cold air aloft there. Lots of instability. This is the other cyclone. These are these are mid-latitude cyclones. This is another one sitting over the Atlantic and then a, even another one after that. Some of these out here were producing hurricane force winds and seas anywhere from 30 to close to 50 feet. No, thank you, especially if you're on a ship out there, right? I guess, how else would you care, right? But yeah, that's just too high. But look over here. Look at all this snow. Even down into Arizona. Oh, said it, said it, said it, said it. I'll say it again. Trust me, folks. You want to see this. You know, remember Jack Nicholson and A Few Good Men when he had that line about, and it ended with, you can't handle the truth. He said, you want me on that wall? You want that snowpack out west. You want that. You really do. I don't, if you live in Charleston, South Carolina, and you don't give two whatevers about California snow, you need to because it's important for a lot of reasons. That snowpack, a very good thing to see. All right, I'll stop harping on it. You get it, but I just have to keep, you know, because it's a good thing. Weather can sometimes have positives even when it's inclement. All right, speaking of inclement weather, here are the different convective outlooks. This is today, and this, of course, is where the tornado watch is currently. Yes, some instability out west, so we could see some severe, eh, not severe, but just general thunderstorms out in the western parts of the country. Moving ahead to tomorrow, limited mostly to the extreme western portions of the west coast. So that's good. But then as we progress, uh, there's that gulf doing its dirty work there, advecting. Advection means the lateral or horizontal movement of warm air or any kind of air. And in this case, it's warm, moisture-laden air. And then these troughs are digging in and going up like this. This is your battle zone through here. 
and you know the rest. And then as we get out beyond this to the day four through eight, yikes, another big one for Dixie, and then the southeast as a whole. So we'll look at these individually. Louisiana, eastern Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, that's the highest area. I bet we get a moderate again. And I'm telling you, I mean, this gulf down here being so warm, several degrees in some areas above normal, we've seen it these last several years, really going back almost 10 years now. There's definitely been a change. I have spoken with several people about this. Rob Perillo uh, down in Lafayette, really noticing it because, I mean, he lives down there. He knows that area very well. A profound change in the Gulf of Mexico sea surface temperature pattern. It's not a one-off if it's been happening for almost a decade now. I don't know the exact numbers, but we've seen it time and again. The Gulf just isn't cooling off in the winter, and it stays warm. It's above average. you got all that extra latent heat. That translates into energy. Heat is energy, and then you add to that the moisture. A moist, warm atmosphere is primed for convection, storminess, and that's what we're seeing here. So this severe threat coming up on Thursday I think it is, uh, really needs to be taken seriously Wednesday, Thursday, and even into Friday. That's where we get out here to day five, into the southeast. Be ready for it. Stay on top of it, all right? We'll end things with just a quick look at the GFS. I like this little surface map action that Levi has uh, crafted for us to peruse at our at any time you want. I love it. It's nice. So here's the parade of storms going across the U.S. All those blue areas, yeah, that's snow, frozen precip. And the denser of the gradient, the darker blue, that's heavier snow. And then, you know, the same thing with rain. The more colors you get, typically the higher the rate of precip. And uh, as we move across you know, and through time, a pretty big storm looks like it's going to come out of Oklahoma, Texas. That's what triggers that severe threat on Thursday. And you can see that right here. I'll just draw your attention to it just to be sure you know what you're looking at. That moves up to the north and east, and it's, again, blocked from turning the coast, turning the corner, and riding up the coast because of this stubborn high out here. And is that ever going to move? We'll, we'll see. Um, I think we could see some ice and snow and just slushy kind of like ugh, by the end of the week for the northeast here. Um, enough so that I might. We'll have to see how things trend. Syracuse is way below average. I was talking with my friend Greg Diamond up at Fox Weather about this on a message conversation today. How dry is Syracuse in terms of the snow? They are running well below average. So if this storm comes to pass, the GFS is, I think, the farthest north. The Canadian is more south. The Euro is more south. If Syracuse looks like they're going to get a lot of snow, several inches, it's been so unsnowy up there that I'm, I might go up there this weekend uh, Friday into Saturday, that's the weekend, and um, report on it, talk about it, go see it. You know, you think about Syracuse, uh, it snows in Syracuse all the time. Well, not this winter. So stay tuned about that and other stuff. And if you live up there, the Hudson Valley included, maybe even Buffalo, uh, there could be some ice and snow headed your way. There's some up there today in some of those areas, like I showed you earlier, but more could be coming towards the end of the week. And, of course, in between the threat of severe weather. All right? All right, now you're up to date on everything, at least from my perspective. This is all the stuff that I would look at, whether or not you are where you are. This is what I do. That's what I, every day, all the stuff I look at, this is part of it. It's just awesome with social media, YouTube especially here, that uh, I can share it with you. And I appreciate you letting me do that, as always. Don't forget, don't be shy. Subscribe to the channel. Do the notification button or bell or whatever it is. And you'll be notified when we go live or when I post a video and it'll be great to have you uh, part of what we do you know just by subscribing if you desire alright have a good rest of your week I'll uh, keep you posted on what may or may not be happening with the potential for a northeast snow event we'll have to wait and see how that flushes out and whether or not I end up in Syracuse eh, we'll know before the end of the week as always thanks for tuning in I am Mark Sutter Hurricane Track I'll talk to you at least in a week or so, if not beforehand, if I travel up to New York.